Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I'm super excited to be here actually. You know, it's, uh, let me give some context of where I come from um, because I'm gonna assume a lot of you don't know and then I'll spiel a little bit about uh, a couple of point of views I have that might be interesting given uh, the audience and then I'd love to go into Q&A because I think that's where the most interesting stuff happens. So I, uh, I was born in the former Soviet Union. I came to the US when I was three. We grew up super poor. I lived in a studio apartment in Queens with eight family members. It was a really tough upbringing. Uh, my dad got a job as a stock boy in a liquor store uh, making two bucks an hour. Uh, and I kind of grew up with that American dream merchant kind of world. We, uh, we were very immigrants, saved every dollar and eventually five or six years into the US, my dad bought uh, a small liquor store in New Jersey. Uh, I moved to Jersey when I was six. I was very entrepreneurial, lemonade stand, baseball cards, washing cars, raking leaves, shoveling snow, anything to kind of make a buck. Um, when I was uh, in the US, when I was uh, 12 or 13, baseball cards were a very big deal. Every, everybody collected them. And I was making one to $2,000 a weekend selling baseball cards as a 12, 13 year old. So probably the richest I'll ever be. Um, and uh, that was great, but then I turned 14 and I was first generation oldest son from the old country, which meant I got dragged into my dad's liquor store. Uh, got paid two bucks an hour to bag ice for 15 hours a day. Um, so it was kind of hardcore. I always tell a lot of my friends that I grew up much more like their grandparents than they did because we were so first generation. When I was 17, I realized that people collected wine. And that was a big deal for me because I didn't want to go into my family business, though I wanted to because I thought I could do it much better than my dad. Um, but I wasn't passionate about selling beer or liquor. Uh, but this wine thing was super interesting to me and by the time I was 18, somewhere between 16 and 18, I went completely all in. I mean, scary to think back how much I learned about wine as a teenager. And I decided that I wanted to open up 4,000 wine shops all across America. Uh, eventually build a big business, sell it, and buy the New York Jets, which is my uh, career ambition. Um, when I was 18, even though I only spent about 30 minutes of my life on a computer at that point, uh, I was in college uh, and I went to my friend's dorm room and I heard the uh, dial-up internet sound for the first time and in 1994, about 14 minutes into surfing the web, I ended up on a bulletin board in AOL uh, that was selling baseball cards and I realized that I could sell shit through this machine. Uh, 24 months later, I launched one of the first three e-commerce wine businesses in America called winelibrary.com and, uh, and that became my career. Spent $15,000 on building that website. I was still at university and so uh, nobody back home at the liquor store knew what to do with it. So on that $15,000 investment, the uh, wine e-commerce site in the first two years of operations sold less than $2,000 in wine. I don't know how many of you have a uh, Soviet father, but uh, Sasha Vaynerchuk was not happy with the ROI. <laughs> uh, uh, in 1998, I came home and took over the business. Uh, and from 1998 till 2003, in a five year window, I grew my dad's business from a $3 million to a $65 million a year business. I did it uh, on the religion that allows me the, uh, the humbleness to sit in front of you guys here today, which is when you have no money and the business, just for context, did $3 million a year in revenue, 10% gross profit, so $300,000 before expenses. Luckily, Sasha didn't pay anybody anything, but still, there was really no money. The only way to uh, build that business as quickly as I did, especially in a time when the internet was quite immature and there wasn't the kind of user base that we all have now, there was no venture capital, there was no M&A activity. I built it because I made every penny of my advertising work like a hundred dollar bill. And how I did that in 1996 was I launched an e-commerce site when nobody did that. Uh, in 1997, I launched an email newsletter that had 200,000 people on it that had 91% open rates and 55% click through to add to cart button uh, because in 1997 nobody was doing email marketing in the US market or any market for that matter. Uh, the day Google AdWords came out in 2000, I bought the word wine and I owned it for nine, nine months for five cents a click. 
Basically, my career is very different than the, the legendary status of this agency, which is all of my career in the first five to seven years was predicated on the one thing that is my religion. So, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a smart thing and a, and a thing that I believe in my heart to say in this room. I truly believe that creative is the variable of success. That the creative is the difference between selling 1,000 cases of that wine or one bottle of that wine. And I think that's the way the world will be forever. My problem, my excitement, my debates, my passion, my hours are spent on the fact that I believe most people deploy creative into a gap of attention that is overpriced. So my career was built on buying attention at a very low cost. E-commerce, email marketing, and Google AdWords in 97, 2000 was grossly underpriced by the creative and advertising shops of the world and by the businesses and startups of the world. And that's why I was able to build such a big business. I continued that path with banner retargeting when that wasn't a thing and my career took a really different turn and probably started my path to this seat in 2006 when YouTube came out. YouTube came out, I thought it was gonna be a big deal and within four months of YouTube being alive, I started a wine show and every day for five years I sat in front of a camera for 20 minutes and drank four bottles of wine. (laughs) That was a good gig. Um, In the first year and a half of YouTube, 2006 to 2007 and a half, very few people watched it. There was not a single video that had a million views. It was building. By 2008, I, I was selling hundreds of cases of wine per episode if I reviewed the wines carefully and properly. Um, and it was the first time in my career that I was selling stuff where there was no paid distribution. It was completely predicated on the content itself and the organic distribution of the channel. A few months later, Google bought YouTube for $1.6 billion. Um, that was the point where my career changed. Uh, I read an article that Ron Conway, angel investor, was set to make you know, $25 million on his $50,000 investment and it was the first time I realized you know, this gift of being right about e-com and Google AdWords and email and Google and YouTube, it has to pay off more than selling a couple more cases of Bordeaux or Burgundy. And so I promised myself the next time I felt it, the next time I felt that feeling that has so dictated the success of my life that I would invest. Uh, I went to South by Southwest the following March because I wanted to learn more about this web 2.0 thing that was happening. Uh, and uh, there was an app everybody was making fun of called Twitter. I thought it reminded me a lot of early email marketing. I became very friendly with the founders and a couple months later I invested in Twitter at a $50 million valuation. A um, Couple weeks later I made my first business video. It was called Facebook Should Be Worried About Twitter. I explained why I thought Twitter was a very exciting thing and why this new force Facebook should be paying attention to it. It led to Mark Zuckerberg's team reaching out to me. I flew out to Palo Alto and spoke to their company. Uh, Gave a talk about consumer behavior and the attention graph. Uh, Mark luckily agreed with a lot of stuff. We had dinner and a couple weeks later I bought a shitload of stock from his parents. Uh, A week later I came home to New York, had my first lunch with David Karp, decided that Tumblr was gonna be a big deal and uh, three months later I invested in Tumblr. So as an investor, I'll probably never do better than my first three investments. Um, I've gone on to invest in Birchbox and Uber and, and, and Buddy Media and Wildfire and a lot of good things and have done quite well but back then I understood that all those platforms attention was underpriced. It's the way that I know that any brand in the world that you work with, uh, definitely now in the UK and the US and many other markets, if they are trying to sell something, sneakers, a soda, a piece of candy, clothing to a 15 to 25 year old, 95% of the ideas in this room at Vayner and many other rooms are not going to work because we're gonna deploy stories in places where 15 to 25 year olds are not spending their attention. You know, uh, I'll use Mondelez, Sour Patch Kids was probably one of our most interesting case studies in the US. The brand manager literally almost got fired for doing what I recommended to be done which was in 2015, in 2014 they spent all of their money on a commercial that was running on Spike Television because they were trying to reach 15 to 25 year olds. Business was down 7.5%. In 2015 when we took over the business, we moved every single dollar to only Instagram and Snapchat. There was no reporting to justify the spend. Mondelez's modeling mix 
didn't prove that moving those dollars to those channels was gonna do anything. The first nine months of our activities, because the reporting wasn't back yet, uh, the brand manager was literally on the process of being fired out of the organization. When it was all said and done last year, Sour Patch Kids in the US had the fastest growth of any candy brand in the last 10 years. Because I don't know if you know this, this is a crazy fucking thought, but 15 to 25 year olds spend their attention in Instagram and Snapchat. We have, right now in marketing, and just all over the world, a stunning disrespect for attention and a gross, overwhelming, overwhelming respect for bullshit metrics, headlines, awards, and a ton of shit that has nothing to do with actually selling product. Now, now, thank you my man, now. (laughs) That being said, it's an interesting thing because look, I'll, I'll say this and this is super important to say here because I think context is everything. I am in advertising now for the last seven years. Really I've been running the company for five years. Just for context, since you're in this world, I've grown the agency from 30 to 650 people, from three to $100 million in revenue. Um, No M&A, no cash infusion. And I'm still selling something nobody wants. You know, nobody wants our creative, nobody even thinks of VaynerMedia as a creative shop. Um, And and I know enough to, I, I don't know much about the advertising world. Right, like if you told me you'd give me $50 billion right now if I could name the CEO of your company or any other company, I would not be able to do that. I I don't know it, you know, when I go to Cannes I feel super out of place because I have no idea what the fuck anyone's talking about. Um, I don't know the space very well, I mean that. And so the reason I just did that little rant was I, I do know enough, as a matter of fact, I even use your guy's name in some of my speeches because I know this is a special place I know this is one of those places that is so well known for their great creative and things of that nature. And, and I'm a funny guy because I speak so much about creative being subjective, because it is. Because it's subjective when it's you and it's me and I run Dove and you're the creative lead for Wyden and it's just you and I and we decide that this idea versus that idea is what goes on television. That is 100% subjective. Just so everybody knows, it's 100 fucking percent subjective. Now, when it goes into real life, it becomes not subjective. The market decides. However, what bothers me is it made a lot of sense from 1955 to 2010 to do it that way because you didn't have the ability to scale your IP prior to putting it in the market. For every Just Do It and MasterCard Priceless, there have been thousands in this room this is so interesting to me, this is funny, I haven't really spoken too much at shops like this, or creative shops in general, and definitely not at this level. In this room, there have been five to 11 ideas at individual levels that literally were the game-changing idea for a business that never saw the day of life because of the way creative and brands work together in a 2016 world. Because you were too junior and the senior person decided not that idea, this idea, right? Or because when you presented it, the brand manager, and you guys, I mean, I assume this is how you guys think about it. It's fun for me to watch. As I've mapped what we do for a living, I look at the people that make the decision to run shit and I'm like, this is the craziest shit I've ever seen. These are actual business operators. Which by the way, as I think you guys are getting, I didn't grow up drawing and fucking being an artist. I'm a salesman. I love brand managers. I love people who give a shit about margin and fucking stacking and caps and selling shit. That is my religion. I love them. But do I think that they are the right person to make a judgment call on a creative execution? I do not. And I see it every single day. And so the whole model to me is fundamentally broken because I have the ability and the luxury, honestly, to come from outside eyes. I didn't know any different. I didn't know why awards and headlines meant so much in this world until I realized, ah, that's how agencies get talent and get new clients. Of course, that makes so much sense, right? I don't understand why media buying agencies tell all their clients to do programmatic ad buying when there's literally no worse piece of fucking advertising in the world than a banner ad on a fucking website when the whole world's going to mobile and you don't even see the banner ad because it's on the bottom left hand corner below the fold on womenswomens.org. 
But then I'm like, oh, I see, because that's the highest profit margin for Group M and Digitas. That's why they push it. So, you know, as you start getting in it, if you don't understand the historical context, if you don't, if you're just not romantic about the way it was, you start understanding pieces of this industry. Here's the punchline problem or the opportunity. Just depends on where you sit on this issue. We're going into a day and age where technology is catching up to two fundamental things that are gonna matter to everybody in this room and everybody outside of this building, which is data is catching up to justify and understand what the ROI is of things more and more every single day. If you really understand what's, see, I have a really nice advantage. I live my life really is more in Silicon Valley than I do in Madison Avenue. And so for example, I'm an investor in many startups right now that already have pilot programs with Coca-Cola and Green Mountain Coffee and Procter and Gamble where their packages are smartified and you can actually start justifying and understanding the whole funnel of the transaction. You can start quantifying some of the behaviors. I mean, it's gonna be fun. We're gonna understand what we do for a living here more than ever before in a 10 year period. And, and I'm not talking about direct response, I'm talking about branding and how it actually justifies control tests with smart packaging. Understand, really understanding the ROI of things. At the same token, and I think you guys know this, every single day, technology is moving into a world where they're blocking advertising because advertising, my friends, for the last 70 years has done one thing more than it's done anything else. It's stolen time from the end consumer. Advertising for the last 70 years has been built to not let you do what you actually wanted to do, stop you, and then tell you about something. You're watching a show, and all of a sudden it stops, and we try to sell you fucking beer, right? You're reading an article, you turn the next page, you wanna finish your fucking article? No, we're gonna give you a full page of a fucking car, right? <laughs> like, like, this is what advertising has done. And online too, you go to ESPN.com, we're not gonna let you read the article. The whole fucking page is gonna be taken over by an Acura fucking car riding at me, right? And so, and so what we have is we have the world of advertising stealing our time while, when you look at what DVR did, if you actually understand, one of the, the, one of the great mistakes of my career is I passed on Uber's angel round twice. Very friendly with the founding team, passed twice. Invested in the next round because it came to New York and I understood, holy shit, Uber doesn't sell transportation, Uber sells time. The reason people take Ubers is the per- even the perception of the car being there, the perception of those five minutes. If you actually look at your own behavior, and I don't know your financial status, but you will be stunned, no matter where your financial status is in the world, if you look at big data, how much people spend on time, convenience, when they can't even afford it because it's important to them. And if you look at what advertising has been built on, it's been stealing time versus vice versa. So when I think about all the digital marketing that everybody's doing and how much of it's predicated on time stealing in a desktop environment when, oh I don't know if you heard, this is the only fucking way we're gonna consume the internet, right? And it's happening on an everyday basis and all those tactics don't work here, I'm fascinated by that stuff. And look, the other thing, and look, I know this is, I assume this is a television shop from what I know and things, Listen, I, you know, I, do, I do not understand how anybody in this room, as a common sense human being, doesn't understand that television commercials are in major, major friction against the market right now. People are not consuming as much television commercials as, you know, it's so funny, all my TV creative shop friends, CEOs that I meet at things, they're like, Gary, TV consumption's through the roof. I'm like, no shit. Everybody's watching Breaking Bad, everybody's watching fucking House of Cards, and everybody's fucking watching Game of Thrones, but who the fuck is watching the commercials? Fast forwarding globally has declined last year for the first time during DVR and TiVo and those things because the new behavior, and you know this because you actually do it as a human, maybe not as a marketer and as a creative, but as a human you do, the second you're watching something and a commercial comes on, you grab this. Everybody loves to talk about live sports commercials being this great thing. I don't understand why people don't look at the most basic data, which is the singular biggest lift in Twitter activity is during global sporting events when they go to commercials. Because you know, 
after something happens, you grab your phone and you want to tell everybody your opinion on LeBron James's dunk or your opinion on that big match or that big fight or whatever you just saw. So what happens is your attention's here while some Jeep goes up the mountain over there. My friends, listen, listen. I have no interest in coming in here and saying, oh, what you do, like, I just want you to know one thing. If you go look at what happened in the 1950s to the early 60s, when the society switched from radio to television, it is an absolute preview to what's happening as we live and breathe today. This is the television. And the television is the radio. And you do it every single day. And more importantly, go walk outside and watch the 40 and 50 and 60 year olds do it too. This is not a 13 year old girl phenomenon. And social media, just for kicks and giggles, just to settle this fucking conversation once and for all, there's no social media. It is a slang term that somebody came up with. It's a term we use for the current state of the internet. And if you believe in this thing, just kicks and giggles, this is just data, 53% of all of our attention, 53% of all of our attention on this device, this is added up time on apps, not opinion, is spent on social networks. When you start looking at social media as the current state of the internet, where people's attention actually is, it gets a lot harder to disrespect it. But the skill that sits so heavily in this room doesn't go away. It just has to, in my, one man's opinion, it just has to change its context to where the stories are being told. And it's funny, when I started my company, I started hiring fancy creatives, creative directors from this place and Droga 5 and 72 and Sunny and all these fucking places, right? All, all the creatives hated me because they would go watch two videos and they'd hear something like this. What they didn't realize is what I believe is the following. How many of you in this room, by show of hands, I just want to know, have seen the extra gum commercial that's run on YouTube or Facebook, the two minute version of where the guy draws the love notes and the extra gum wrappers? Please raise your hand for my own context. Raise it high, I want to see how many. All right, five. I get it. Respect. It's probably why I saw it at first too. Uh, we're on that gum business too. Uh, so that was fascinating to me. I think you guys will get a kick out of this story. In the US, there's a, a video, you can see it online. They ran a 30 second spot version of it for seven and a half months and the business, the, and again, Again, maybe, you know, listen, this is very honest truth. I do stereotype that a lot of agencies actually don't care about selling stuff. But here's good news. I've come to learn that a lot of my clients don't actually want to sell stuff either. People's behavior is predicated on their personal interest. Of course you want to do award winning work. It's good for your career. Of course my people want headlines. My clients, they want headlines. Because then they get promoted. Everything's backwards. People are just humans and they're reverse engineering their own vested interest and they should. I'm not mad. It's just life. Just true. Anyway, 30 second spot, nine months, decline. Decline in sales. They made a full version of it. They go, you know, what the hell? Let's put it on Facebook. The one minute and 53 second version of it is a far more compelling story. It didn't have to fit into the box of a system that was built in 19 fucking 65. And the person that was the creative and the writer actually got to tell their fucking story the way it was meant to be told. And you know, I don't know if you know, but there's a lot of people on Facebook. You know, this whole scale thing is really intriguing. There's plenty of fucking scale. There's more scale on Facebook every day of the week than there is on any number one television show in the world times 10. Just raw data, unemotional. So a remarkable thing happened. I don't know if, you know, just stunning. Funny thing happens because, I don't know, stories in video form work. I think we'll all agree. And so, because it was actually consumed, because it was actually told as a story in its full, complete way, and because people have the ability to pass things on on Facebook, can't take my TV and throw it to somebody, the product exploded, the video exploded, it went secondarily on YouTube, which I think now has 15 million views or something absurd, and the business has been up double digits every day since 30 days after they put it up on Facebook for the last seven months. Everything you do for a living works. My argument to the whole goddamn marketplace is you're telling these stories in places where people aren't anymore. And it's declining by the minute. Do I think people randomly catch commercials? Of course. 
Do I think that it is massively overpriced attention? Yes, I do. Why is billboard pricing globally in the world up 12% when every single person here went on the bus or in a taxi or not the primary driver is looking at their telephone? Can you tell me with any fucking common sense that impressions on billboard are more valuable today than they were 10 years ago? Absolutely not. It's the same reason I love Super Bowl commercials, real quick. On the flip side, I think the Super Bowl commercial may be the single most underpriced asset in the world of attention, period. In the US, I think it was five or six million dollars for a spot this year. I've recommended ABI and Mondelez and Pepsi and all my clients to spend as much as 25 million on a spot because every single person in America watches it. Everybody, whether they watch it on YouTube before or they watch it when it airs. Now, the creative, a lot of times people are doing things for the sake of winning instead of the sake of selling stuff, but that's a whole different conversation. And really, honestly, I, I don't even have a lot of passion about that because I do think it's subjective. And actually, I'm sorry, I, I got off this tangent, I wanna go back because I think this is the part that made my creatives finally like me, which has been a relief. If you're a team of an ECD and a CD and an ACD and you got a client and you got a strategist and you got an account person that thinks they know what the deal is and everybody's jamming, I just love the idea of being able to be in a place where if you've got an idea for Trident gum, right, that all four of you can see the day of life of your story, you can run it at scale on Facebook, you can get feedback from actual consumers, not focus groups where we put them in weird rooms and show them animatronics or whatever the fuck you call it, and everyone's like, yeah, real good. It's, I mean, <laughs> It makes no sense, like every time I look at this stuff, I, I, I really, you know, again, maybe I'm too foreign, maybe I'm wrong, which is very possible, I've been that before, but these things, my first, you know what, let's go back to this story and then I'll keep jumping, this is how I roll. <laughs> my first meeting, first one, ever, first one, start the company, we land Campbell Soup, I'm gonna put them on Facebook, they're like, what's Facebook? I'm like, this is perfect, this is my world. I go into my first meeting, it's a V8, V8 juice, you guys have V8 here? Good, V8 fucking juice meeting, I sit down, all, it's an IMC or something, like all the fucking you know, agency partners, right? I sit down, I'm super pumped. I, I promise myself I'm gonna shut up, which is rare for me, I need to learn. I need to shut my fucking mouth, I'm gonna listen and learn so I don't say a goddamn thing. And here we go, first comes up the PR company. It's a, just a recap, great news, we got 987 trillion impressions for you last month because they got you know, a mention on Huffington Post, seventh page in, bottom left hand corner, but you know, they gave the credit for the entire monthly reach of HuffPo.com for their metrics. So that started off tough, but you know, 800 trillion impressions, everybody claps. Then somebody comes up, whether it was the creative shop or somebody else, they did something, they showed some creative, and they go, great news, Millard Brown, I never heard that word before, Millard Brown says it's the greatest shit that ever happened. Yay, everybody claps, right? So the, uh, the activation agency comes up, goes, great news, we went to the NCAA tournament and we gave out a bunch of fucking soup and we got 700 trillion people to try it. I'm like, I, I'm like, this is an amazing world. Somehow, they figured out how many people actually tried the soup by giving out samples, yet every event I've ever given to, all the fucking samples are on the ground, but cool, unbelievable, seven million people tried fucking V8 soup, great. Now I'm getting antsy because this is why I failed everything in school and why there's, I basically just went to the last page which said, the business is down 19%. So finally, four different people present, the digital shop comes up, and honestly, you know what's funny? I will take a, t- as much as I just railed on television commercials, if you call it that, I will take a TV commercial over 90% of the bullshit, digital shit that people sell, pre-roll, banner, takeover stuff that nobody wants. I, I would call those impressions that are negatives. You know, people, I mean, when are we gonna start, by the way, real quick, just as a side note, there's a tidbit, can we start debating the value of an impression? Why is everybody predicated on the impression? Like, you know, impressions can be bad. Like, awareness can be bad. Like, everybody knew who Hitler was, that wasn't good. Like, impressions can be bad. Like, I will never buy a Samsung product because they kept doing pop-up banner ads on ESPN.com that annoyed me so much. And by the way, you guys know this, on mobile devices, those little X's are small and our thumbs are big. So those 100 impressions that I by accident clicked into seven times, back at Group M, everyone's like, yeah, 7%. (laughs) Meanwhile, 
Meanwhile, I will never buy a Samsung, I, sw- I mean literally the seventh time I called my wife, I said, I swear, when I die, you can remarry, you can do whatever the fuck you want, but nobody in this family while I'm alive buys Samsung. <laughs> it's true. So, I finally raised my hand to the Campbell's meeting. I go, listen, I, look, I come from entrepreneur land, I come from running my own businesses, I'm missing something, I know this is billion dollar companies, I don't want to deploy my hundred million dollar business mentality, but I've got to ask. I've just sat through this meeting and I know I'm gonna, and, and I was very, look, I'm self-aware, like I was like, look, I know this is gonna be like, who the fuck is this guy and what the fuck, right? But I was like, I have to ask because I have to learn. How can we have such a compelling meeting for 45 minutes where everybody did everything right and why is the business down 19%? And no joke, this is my first corporate America meeting, advertising, big brand meeting. Everybody looks at me and goes, yeah, fucking confusing. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. I, I literally said, I literally said, I said, could we debate the metrics that you guys score on? And then that was it. And that was the beginning of a six year period where I've come to realize you can't. You know, once the organization decides to accept ACE testing, do you guys know about this ACE testing thing? I don't know, my ABI client does that. They make a commercial and then they have to run it through an ACE test which is the, like something out of a 1927 like sci-fi movie and that justifies what sees television. Or this, am, I, I know I'm saying it wrong, am, what is it, animatic, I'm sorry? Animatic. Yeah, pictures that people, I mean like just stuff that makes no sense. Stuff that makes no sense. And so, I don't know, I'm confused, but not confused, meaning there's a reason, you know, uh, because I spend a lot of time in startup land, I would tell Dove and Johnson & Johnson clients, I'm like, hey, you gotta look out for method. Hey, you gotta look out for honest company. These things are happening. And they would laugh them out. When Dollar Shave Club's video, bless you, when Dollar Shave Club's video went viral, I think, I think that's like television. That's a lot of video views. I called Gillette people because I was very friendly with the former CEO and said, you gotta take a look at this. They literally, this is not a joke, they literally laughed me off the call. And, and now, of course, there's the Gillette Shave Club, right? <laughs> there's, I don't understand why we look at the marketing behaviors of an Airbnb or an Uber or all these startups that really go from zero to 300, 800, 900 million dollars in sales and they act one way and then we all sit on pieces of businesses that act a different way and they continue to decline. I mean, they're all declining. Like, and, they're, and you know, everybody's like, how? And, and it's the same thing that happens in American politics. Like, I kept making videos, I'm like, Obama's gonna win, Obama's gonna win, Obama's gonna win, because he did surgical digital marketing, and everyone's like, no, and then he won, and now everyone's like, Trump, how did this happen? We never, like, because he actually went to where people's attention is. It's just attention. My friends, the only thing you're in here, the only business you're in here is attention, and then your part starts, right? And then your part starts, and then is your story is your copy, is your art compelling enough to sell? But my creatives are happy with me because we have a process now where we do four to seven commercials for a client, test them at scale, and then whatever wins. You know, the person that actually wants to buy stuff reacts to, that gets to see the light of day. But can you imagine, can you imagine what's happened in our four walls for the creatives that have worked in shops like this for the last 10 years to actually have their ideas see the day of light because we also built an internal production house. We drive down the costs. There's a way to make you know, a $400,000 video for $190,000. You hack at it. You find the inefficiencies in what the market's done and all of a sudden when you do that and all of a sudden when you convince a client to spend media efficiently, there's a couple dollars left over for creative and all of a sudden you've got all four stories and then interesting things happen. For example, we ran a piece of content that starred African American families and then targeted African American families on Facebook and a remarkable thing happened, it worked. You know, you know in the US there's a, show, there's a channel called BET, African Americans watch more of that because they star in it. We run Asian Americans on certain stuff and they watch it because when you see yourself within the creative, it works and on television, everything's vanilla because you have to make it for everybody and then every slogan's like, just do it or for the good of it or yeah. Everything's fucking vanilla. Like I couldn't imagine, as I've gotten to know you guys better, this is the only world you should give a shit about. 
This is the world that gives you the opportunity to do you instead of complete vanilla, blunt, wide objects that strip all the shit that you have in your heart. So, I don't know, I think the golden era of creative's coming and I think it's gonna come in the form of Facebook and it makes me laugh because all my creatives that have been doing it for 12 to 20 years poo poo it and think it's shit and think it's third tier and fucking Bush League because they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. That's why. And so, I don't know, it's gonna be fun to watch over the next 10 years. I know this, I know that, uh, I know that We've never seen the friction between big brands and their media buying agencies like we've seen over the last three years because they're starting to wake up and realize the two biggest margin areas for media buying agencies are television and programmatic ad buying and ironically that's the only fucking thing that they tell them to do. I know that and I know that that's gonna change where dollars get allocated and how they're gonna get allocated and I know that uh, we have a whole generation of people that are not gonna be rewarded for doing the thing that doesn't get them fired. So. I'm, I'm religious about attention. I couldn't imagine selling something to an 18 year old in America and not spending 80% of my money on Snapchat creative. Why? They don't spend another minute anywhere else. Why in the world? And I don't give a shit what your reports say or what you grew up with. The market is the market is the market. And I'm telling you, especially if you love advertising, please go study what happened from 1955 to 1965 in the US market I can speak for, I'm not quite as sure here of the timing or if that's exactly what happened, but I'm sure it is. Because when the collective of our society's attention shifts platforms, carnage and opportunity happen at the same time. The four biggest beer brands in America all collapsed because they were romantic about radio. Because there was creatives at the shops that loved writing copy for radio and didn't give a shit about this 30 second video bullshit on this black and white thing that nobody's gonna watch. That's why, that's exactly what's happening right now. And here's the punchline, I'll go into Q&A and please go into any detail. I didn't talk a lot about social but if you wanna talk about Musical.ly or, or Anchor or, or Snapchat or whatever you'd like to talk about. Um, it was romance that put everybody out of business and the thing that bothers me about romance is it lacks practicality. I hate when I go and speak at these companies or agencies and they go, he's a disruptor and he's a real disruptor, here he is, Gary. And I get up there and I'm like, I'm not a fucking disruptor. I'm the most practical fucking guy in this room. You know what I think's disruptive? Trying to sell a 25 year old in 2016 something through a fucking television commercial. That's disruptive, that's fucking insanity. And you know what bothers me the most and I'll end with this? You know this when you walk out of this fucking hall. You know this, it's what you do every fucking day as a normal human. It's what your parents are doing every day. You see it right in your face but because this is what you do for a living, you trick yourself when you walk through these doors. That's wrong. It just is. It just is. Thank you. What's your name, my man? So over the last, uh, so the average age of VaynerMedia, so we're 650 people, I would say the average age is probably 28. And only in the last 150 employees did we even hire anybody over 35 because, so there's a couple advantages. I don't run on any margin, right? Like that helps me do good work. For my, I can make $400,000 videos for a buck 80 because I don't run on any margin. The reason I don't run any margin, just to get to the real punchline with you guys, I think you might find it fascinating, is I wanna build a private equity business on top of my agency. So I wanna still buy the New York Jets. I just don't wanna open up 4,000 liquor stores. My belief is that we, all of us in advertising, that I guess it's Ogilvy, the 50% of my money I'm wasting, I truly in my heart think it's 90% now. And in that arbitrage, I think I can buy brands and market them the right way and make a lot of money. So if you know who 3G is, the private equity firm that bought ABI and bought Heinz and bought Cred, <laughs> I wanna build the reverse of that. What they're good at is they buy a business and they strip it. Like they bought Burger King and they had like 1,400 employees and now they have 30. Like they do that kind of shit. They print on both sides of the paper, the CEO flies fucking coach, middle seat. You know, that's what they do. <laughs> cool, and I fucking, as an immigrant I respect the shit out of it. 
I, my whole career has been predicated on growing businesses. So we're young because I couldn't afford to pay any. I mean, we, you know, we, we, when you, when you, we've grown a lot from, we did $3 million 48 months ago. You can't afford this kind of talent on that kind of you know, top line revenue. Over the last 15, 18 months, we've started being able to afford people. And uh, it's been super interesting. And, uh, and it's gotten older, but the truth is, we just hired our first chief creative officer, right? Started literally nine days ago. He was at Crispin and Porter for six years. I spent six months trying to find the person that, and this was the order of what mattered to me. First, emotional intelligence. When I tell you that I don't respect talent, it would upset you. It's stunning when I run my business how secondary pure talent is to people skills. This notion that some creative is so fucking special that they can be a douchebag and fuck up the entire place is the stupidest shit I've ever heard in my life. And I'm very unpopular in tech land. I did it again at South by where I was like, fuck Steve Jobs. I don't want to run an industry, a business where being mean brings the best out of, I don't give a shit if you're a creative genius. Fucking act like a normal person, you asshole. <laughs> so, so first I was, I'm always scared of that and I think that's what, we have unbelievable, my, C, my C, uh, uh, CIO, oh, but he's really our CEO, my brother's my CEO partner, but James Orsini, he was the CFO and CEO of, of uh, of Saatchi and Saatchi, for, and he's been in that ecosystem for 25 years. When he came and saw our voluntary turnover rate, he was like, what are you doing? Because you know, he knew our salaries were in line, it wasn't anything like that. I'm like, what we're doing is we're an HR driven organization because I believe continuity trumps everything. Continuity, you know, it's just like sports. A team that stays together usually beats a team with superstars that were put together for one season. And I believe that. And I love continuity at Vayner. We have enormous continuity already for a young company and I want to keep it forever because I give a shit. Rice is now living in London, like she's gonna be part of the London team because four years ago when she started working for me, I'm like, what do you want? She's like, I want to be in London. And I'm like, cool, if we ever go there, you'll go there and then I did it. Like you do, like, and by the way, I don't care if you're driven by money or by work-life balance or by creative output. I individually at 650 care about what you care about and I also know when you get married, you're gonna care about different shit. You know, so, we are an HR driven organization. I needed to find a CCO that understood that. So that was a challenge. When, you know, especially when you're looking from, and I was looking for somebody from a world like this because I wanted to taste what a seasoned veteran from a Wyden, from a Crispin, you know, from, looked like. You know, what, what did that feel like internally? Number two, uh, you know, I wanted somebody who was religious about attention and not the platform he or she was storytelling on. The level of romance in this industry of which platform you're storytelling on is laughable at best and insane at worst. Like really? Like you'd really rather have it on fucking BBC during fucking a segment than have 50 times more people in the world see it? Really? Like why? Because you were told that. Because that's what's rewarded in the current moment. The problem is, what pisses me off is, I have so much compassion for everybody. You guys are young. Like you really think the industry is gonna reward that in seven to 10 years? You think as the Ubers and the Airbnbs become the MasterCards and the Procter and Gambles that they're gonna want your talent when you were that religious? And like, so I sit on panels with all these hotshot young creators. I'm like, dude, you're fucking, you're, you're on the record, you're fucked. <laughs> like, like, you're dead. Like what are you fucking doing, right? So, um, <laughs> So we're young, but quickly growing older, cliche, right? But it, to me, it's really, really not an age thing, truly, because I was stunned by how much Steve Babcock's religion was about wherever. I think if you find the purest form creative that has more practical business DNA than just somebody who just wants to get their nut off, there's just so many creatives that just want to get it done because TV's where the budget is right now and they always wanted to blow up a rock. So like, fuck it, that's where I want to be. If you're religious about getting your story out to the world and you actually have any practitionership understanding of what's happening right now, there's no debate for that person. So we're getting older but that doesn't scare me because I'll be honest with you, I can think of three to four strategy, creative you know, people in the organization that are, let's call it, 40 and above, who I think are more in tune to what's actually going on than a lot of my 26 year olds. A lot of my 26 year olds still grew up wanting to be on ad ages. We, one of my kids ran up to me, he's like, we made, GE, we do, a, GE's been a brand that's gotten a lot of credit for a lot of the work that we've done in the last five years. He's like, we made an ad ages top 10 hit list. And I'm like, 
the fuck is that? <laughs> you know, like, he's like, I've always wanted to be on it. And I was pumped for him because I grew up wanting to be in the wine spectator and I have empathy. Like, if this is your craft, if this is what you always knew, if your dad and mom did this, I don't wanna, I don't wanna destroy that. I just want people to understand it's dangerous to be, the quickest way to go out of business is to be romantic about how you make your money. It's the quickest way. And we're, li- you know, listen guys, I wish, just, I, I didn't get to tell the full story. I built Wine Library in direct mail, outdoor radio, outdoor radio, te- local television, full page ads in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. I wish that marketing didn't change. I had it figured out. I, I have 1.2 million followers on Twitter. Do you know how sad I am that Twitter's fucking losing attention? Fucking worked seven years answering all you fucking questions. That I fucking, <laughs> like, I'm pissed. But it doesn't change the fact that that's what's happening. And so if I have to stay up till three in the morning to figure out how Musical.ly works, because 60 million, 60 million people are using it monthly from zero seven months ago, and if I want to sell a 16-year-old something, I need to know. Just need to know. My man, what's your name? Scott. Scott. A hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I will literally walk back in here four years from now and be like, you guys are doing Facebook, you fucking idiots? A hundred percent, absolutely. It's why I've been such a big advocate of Facebook because out of all the people I've ever met in my life, forget about in business, in my life, I truly believe that Mark Zuckerberg understands EQ more than any, it's so funny because the movie really did a number for him in a good way. They made him see, like the whole story, he built Facebook for a girl. Hollywood's so fucking interesting. Anyway, <laughs> he, he's, his emotional intelligence is so extreme. It's how we became friends back then. It's how I got in. Because he was able to tell, well, this guy gets it and like, in a way that, like, you know. He, um, the reason the algorithm was so brilliant is the only thing Zucks gives a shit about is attention. It's why he bought Instagram. Oh, this is good. Pierce Morgan is a London guy, good. I was on CNN the day Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars because six months earlier, News Corp, another one, they had The Daily, remember The Daily? I I did a show on The Daily once a week about business stuff and tech stuff. I I had a prediction show at the end of the year and I predicted that Facebook would buy Instagram. So four months later they buy it and I get to be on CNN with peers and talk about it. And I go that they stole it. And I don't know if you remember this, this is two years ago. Instagram was 551 days old and they spent a billion dollars on it. People lost their shit. Like a lot of people in America and the world didn't even know what Instagram was yet. And a billion dollars is a lot of money. And there was a lot of money two years ago compared to today. It's just the way the world works. And I go on the show and I go, he stole it. I get out of the studio and there's thousands of people saying I'm an idiot on Twitter. I saved every one of them. When WhatsApp was bought for $18 billion, I ironically went on vacation to Turks and Caicos with my wife and the first day I laid on the beach, pulled up all those tweets and replied to every single person (laughs) on Twitter and said, now what, bitch? (laughs) But the reason I predicted that Zucks bought Instagram and the reason Mark Zuckerberg, think about this, guys, Mark tried to buy Snapchat for $3 billion 18 months ago. The one thing he understands better than anybody executing right now is attention is the only asset. And so he keeps trying to buy the thing that will arbitrage him out. If Facebook did not own Instagram today, there'd be a lot more friction and tension about its health. But because they have another five years behind that, and if they fucking had Snapchat, fucking forget it, right? And I think Evan had the benefit of being rich, so he didn't sell, and two, he had good intuition, and he believes in attention too. If you look at the way the product's built on both of those fronts, this is what I yelled about Twitter. In 2011, I'm like, change the fire hose. People's attention's gonna go away. Create an algorithm. (laughs) These algorithms work because they keep us on it. There's a reason Google created a promotion tab on Gmail. The data was going in the wrong direction because we'd ruined email. So yes, I do think that we, me, I mean I spend every minute trying to ruin Snapchat and Musical.ly. Like, yes I do, I think that's what happens unless these platforms are smart enough to create different ad units that don't steal our time or don't push stuff we don't want. Facebook wins because their data is so insane that I believe that if advertisers actually got their shit together, we could save our industry because I actually want root beer and Lionel Richie and New York Jets ads in my Facebook. And what's really interesting is Facebook's trying to figure this out. 
So many of the media buying companies are such douchebags. They want to buy Facebook in TV-like behavior instead of what they should be doing, which is creating 25 different cohorts, then giving it to you. And now if you know that you're going after a single mom with three kids that all like basketball, that live in Ireland, well, you, think about what you're going to make creatively versus if you're going after moms. Think about that. Think about the creative freedom and volume of different stories we could tell. Think about when I just did that for you versus going moms, what your, where your head went, how many more things you could be doing, the kind of stories you could be telling. So yes, I do, but I do think at least Mark, as such a young CEO of such a big company, will be doing behavior for a long time that may educate future platforms and it'll be interesting to see where it shifts. But absolutely, I do not, I do not think social's on a pedestal. If I was here in 2000, I'd be like, guys, this Google AdWords thing, search, right? To me, I'm, never, I'm always trying to put myself out of business, every day. I'm always, I'm always every day waking up and saying, is this in trouble? It's why I'm heavily, after Twitter was what built me. It's where I came from for this world. It's been the thing that I've been railing on the most for the last 12 months, even though those are my best friends, even though I've made millions of dollars on it, even though I'm sitting on millions of dollars in stock, my reputation of being right is the only asset, and I think it's completely fucking broken. My man. What's your name? Will. Will. Do you think about the media buying and buying in the agency, and how important do you think it is that those two are sort of the like, creative and media buying and buying and put together? We do. We think that, you know, as I'm getting more educated about this industry, I realize, oh wow, this is how they used to do it back in the day, I think that's right. And in our world, when you're making 26 different segmentations and 26 different creative stories, we have to sit together. My teams were we, and it's funny, in a world of OMD and Group M and Starcom, we've chipped away and have won. Quaker just gave us the social media buying duties, even though OMD is the global agency, because we're just able to, in any bake-off of something that shows a quantifiable sale, including bullshit metrics like impressions and click through like marketing jargon, we win every time because the creative is the variable, right? And so you guys are at the mercy of some big buying, you don't, it's, it's crazy to do it that way. It happened because in 1991, Martin Sorrell realized he could make more margin by so- separating this shit. I mean like, this is what pisses me off. This stuff is, I knew nothing. It took, takes me 20 fucking minutes as a common sense businessman to figure out why this shit happens and then everybody goes, award winning work sells product. That's my favorite by the way. I'm sure that gets said here too and definitely gets said in can 5,000 times. Award winning work sells product. You mean the studies that were commissioned by Nielsen's and by creative shops 25 years ago to justify creative? I mean like, where does everybody, like why is everybody so confused? So yes, we absolutely do the buying when we can. Some places we can't do it because we're boxed out by the AOR media buying company but what's great is we'd rather lose the business and continue to push against it to prove it to them, eventually willing our ways to an A-B test which I don't know, miraculously we're like 20 for 20 because when two human beings are sitting next to each other and one's saying, okay, this is gonna go to 23 to 27 year old females who are fans of Burberry and who've commonly gone to Bergdorf Goodman's, the creative has a little bit of an advantage over the other people that are going, 18 to 60 year old females go. I mean, it's, yeah, so yes, we think that, we think that that's gonna happen. We think, I think that will happen to you guys over the next 10 years because there'll be no options. You'll be forced to, I don't know if you guys are owned by a holding company or not, you're independent, so you'll, be, you'll build out that principle and merge with somebody. It's just gonna be important. As dollar, you look, people are gonna follow dollars. Dollars are gonna shift over time. And again, I actually think there's a huge pot of money in just programmatic banner. Funny thing is, ironically, especially given the energy I came in with, I'm not trying to convince most of my clients to stop doing television. I think that's a golden goose that most people are too romantic about. I'll let that play itself out. I'm actually chipping away at banner programmatic because that shit they don't like and it's, a, it's, a, it's so crazy. I mean, uh, when's, the last time I, when's the last time somebody here clicked the banner ad? I mean, there's amazing case studies of people not even seeing banner ads, like being blind to it now, left sides of websites. A lot of UX UI designers, I don't know if there's any in here, are like designing the most, least, least, least important thing on the left side of a website because they know that we've become literally blind to that spot on the right side or left side depending uh, on the market because that's where the ads were. 
Like literally the Facebook generation, the 33 year olds kind of right now, 27 to 33, literally can't see the right side of a website because that's where the Facebook ads were for the five years they were there every day. Literally can't recall, cannot recall. Yes sir, what's your name? Rob. Rob. Uh, what's your tip for the next uh, biggest thing? Talk about Snapchat, love. what's next? You know what's funny? I, I also always this really push against this, the way my brand's positioned in the little circles that know who I am. I don't predict. You know, I, uh, I don't know. What do you invest in? Um, so, <laughs> so there's four companies I'm keeping, so here's, here's my process. I've been watching Snapchat for three and a half years. I got vocal about it two and a half years ago. This last holiday season, de- December, January, I got very loud because I felt it went normal. Meaning, I now do feel, based on the metrics I see that we've tipped over, and 30 and 40 and 50 year olds will be on Snapchat in the next 12 to 24 months. The four platforms that I'm paying attention to are all very different. So I'm looking at Peach, because Dom Hoffman is a very good product guy, but Peach is fucking 41 days old. Like, it can't even begin to be meaningful for a year, and I actually am not very crazy excited about it. Anchor. Anchor is like a voice Twitter. I don't know if you've seen Anchor. Super interesting to me. I've always wanted it because a lot of thoughts, sometimes, like, I've always thought voice Twitter was real. Uh, So this is the closest thing I've seen to voice Twitter. It's called Anchor. Uh, I'm watching that. Um, Musical.ly is the first platform I've seen that has the true potential to be the next Snapchat. If you don't know know what Musical.ly is, you should definitely download it. It's very interesting, based in China. Um, but it's exploded in the US and the UK and other markets. If you go into your, wh- who's Apple here versus Android? Apple? Just do me one favor, you'll be so much smarter for doing it. Every morning, open up the free app, top 150 apps, and look at the charts. It's pure data of where people's attention is. And you'll go there, you'll see Musical.ly is ahead of Twitter for the last 30 days. And then you'll say, what's that? And then you'll download it. And then you'll consume it. Then you'll have ideas. It's a good idea. So Musical.ly is super interesting. Um, Musical.ly, Anchor, Peach. After school is interesting to me. It's like starting to explode in the US. You can only get into it with a high school ID. So it reminds me a lot of Facebook where you could only get in with a fee. So that's gotten some traction. So I'm paying attention. So I watch things. The thing that I do well though, and where, where I've been able to make my reputation is back to not being a uh, disruptor, I'm practical. When I, I'm able to invest in things when they've already won yet the market hasn't accepted them. So when Vine popped, what I did was I just didn't go to sleep until three o'clock in the morning for a month because I'm busy. But every night from midnight to three o'clock in the morning, I literally looked at everything people, I'd listen with my eyes. I just looked at everything that people were doing and I created an account and I started playing. And so I think that the key to a lot of this is, do you know how many of you have an opinion on Snapchat and Snapchat advertising and don't use it? That to me is a problem. Like, do you know how many meetings I've been in with creative shops and digital shops and they say something about Facebook that isn't true? <laughs> like, that isn't true. That, so my big advantage is that I'm an actual practitioner versus a headline reader. As somebody who's really deeply in it, every day on Digiday and Ad Age and PR Week and Ad Week, every day there are multiple headlines and articles that are inaccurate or that there's quotes from people that had vested financial interest for that thing not to happen. So, I'm an investor in Meerkat and wrote a huge check. I think it's dead. Like, my vested interest is predicated on being right so that you guys invite me back to sit here again. So I think that people are very short-sighted. And it's fine when the market doesn't change for 20 or 30 years, you can be a political animal and ride your career. The problem is this market isn't that. Nothing that is important existed 11 years ago. Not the smartphone, not YouTube, not Facebook, not Twitter, not Instagram, not nothing. And nobody here retires in 12 years. The fuck do you think's gonna happen? (laughs) Like, this is is my point to a lot of the youngsters that come in, I'm like, let me tell you what I'm referring to because I'm not being very frank with you. I sit on panels in all these fancy fucking places now, ANA, IRR, fucking can, right? And I listen to people and I get to know them because we have a, we, you know, we're in the green room together for a coffee for an hour before the panel and then eventually you're out at the fucking Facebook party and you see that person, you get a drink. And it's blown me away how many of these people, when you get a couple of cocktails into them, say to me things like, Gary, you're right. 
<laughs> and I'm like, cool. I'm like, here's the part that bothers me the most. I'm like, you're so young. Like all, you just stood in front of the entire industry. All that video is being recorded. And in seven years when you're trying to get a job at some other place that now is built on this thing, they're gonna be like, well this guy's a fucking idiot. I'm like, why are you doing that? How many of you saw the big short, the movie? Raise your hands, I'm just curious. I swear to God, when I watched that movie, I was like, holy shit, this is the advertising industry. <laughs> everybody knows it, and everybody's in on it. And, and I'm not mad, really, I'm really not. Like, even though it comes with a lot of angst, like, people are doing what's right for themselves, I get it. I'm disappointed because I wish I could tell everybody how this plays out. Because when markets change, the rules change, and then when you thought you were doing the safe thing for yourself, you were actually doing the dangerous thing. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, Ian, um, so Mark Zuckerberg here on your Samsung. <laughs> but so he's, he's clearly kind of doubling down on the whole VR thing as being like the yes. thing for the future of Facebook. Like, how do you feel about it? VR is 100%, not 99, the next platform. The problem is, it's much further away than a lot of these tech nerds think. So what, what I learned with the internet, VR is internet 1991. So I'm investing heavy in VR, only B2B, of the companies that I think will get bought by Google, Apple, Samsung, and Facebook. Consumer VR is not even close. You know, like, we couldn't even get ourselves to wear Google glasses. We're gonna go to VR. I think VR hits critical mass when it goes to contact lenses, and it's a good 10, 12, 15 years from now. But we'll start gaming, movies. Everybody in here in five years will probably put on a VR set and watch a movie. Everybody in here in five to seven years will play a video game in VR, but the thought that VR is as close as people think it is, it's not on the consumer level. Because people are grossly, grossly underestimating what makes the fashion industry tick and how consumer behavior actually works. It takes time. It takes t- From an anthropology standpoint, we're further away than we think, but it will happen. Because here's, here's why I think it's gonna happen. I, I, uh, I very young in my age realized, holy shit, I am a focus group of one like everybody else, but I'm such a consummate salesman and was built that way from such a young age. There's something that I am that I don't really even give a fuck about my own opinions. I just try to map what is in this like weird spot in my stomach. It blew me away when I did VR for the first time, not too long ago, the real VR that's coming, kind of some of the preview shit. I took the headset off after an hour. Now, mind you, I wanna give you a little context. Nobody loves people more than me. You could be tied with me, but I love human interaction. It's so funny, social media, when that was being debated, I'm like, that's a gateway drug to actual communication. I love this, you know, like, love it. I took the headset off and I was, and literally subconsciously, which is the part that kind of took me aback, I took it off and said, why would anybody ever take this off? And it fucked with me, it still kind of fucks with me. Because I was like, fuck, if that was my purest reaction to myself, the whole thought of like what's real life and what's not feels very real. Because if you really think about it, if you really go look at a 15, 17, 19 year old, is the life that they're living in their phone more or less real than the life they're living out here. So there's some crazy ass shit coming. I think he's betting because he bets long term. He can afford to. But I'm not expecting all of us sitting at home being actually here right now anytime soon. But we'll all see it. I think we'll all see it. I don't. No, I don't. I'll tell you why. I don't judge humans. We have a good track record. You know, I think, I think human beings are the most underrated brand in the world. I think that if we took your great, great, great grandfather, pulled him up, revived him, made him fresh, and sat him here and let him watch everything we do, he'd be really fucking sad, right? I think that if you take generations, I mean, there was a time only 40 years ago that people felt that Elvis shaking his hips was the devil. You know, like, I think it's evolution. And so, I actually, I'm actually very, happy about technology, let me explain. The cliche current version of sad is the following. You go out with your partner and you go to a restaurant and you see a couple sitting there having dinner and both of them on the phone the whole time. And you judge, because we love to judge, don't we? And you look at somebody and go, that's sad. Look at those two. They fucking on their phone the whole time, that's sad. I see the following. 
most of them, looking around the room, most of you are old enough to remember going to the restaurant 10 years ago and seeing a couple that sat across from each other and didn't say a fucking word to each other <laughs> the entire dinner. So what I see is that same couple 10 years later and I'm happy for them because unlike, t- <laughs> I am, I'm being dead serious. Unlike 10 years ago where they had to sit like this and fucking be miserable, now they have options to be happy at least. I really don't, I don't think it's sad. I think people take the half glass empty point of view on a lot of these issues. If you look at data of an average 14 year old girl in America, she now claims to have many more friends than she did just 10 years ago. Because if you're an introverted or kind of a little bit different 14 year old girl in America, 12, 15 years ago, and probably all over the world, and the serendipity of the high school that you're in didn't give you the fucking luck of having another friend or two that had those interests, you were isolated. But now you have unlimited options through your phone or through Twitch and video games. Like there's a lot of healthy things that are happening. And so maybe I'm an optimist, but the reason I'm not scared or sad is because we've proven for a very long time to adapt. Evolution is real. We're gonna become robots. You can, people can think it's sad, I get it. You know, it's different. But uh, a lot of people think that interracial marriages are sad. A lot of people think that the way girls dress are sad. I mean, there's a lot of things that are sad. Men aren't men anymore. The great generation, we're tough. We're metrosexual. You know, so I think a lot of things are judged. I'm not, I don't judge the way we communicate. We've evolved. Go read what we wrote about the telephone and the television and video games and cell phones. Evolution, baby. Yes? I know you don't predict, but do you think that in the future that people, you know that classic form of um, being together with somebody, like a male and female, would be completely wrong, but because you have all this technology, that I'd be lying if I... It's tiring, isn't it, to be with <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of, there's a, it's fun. If you want to go really, like, like up there, there's a couple things that I think are really interesting that are gonna change our relationships. Number one, I think that it's hard to hide. So I've, there's a, a female researcher at MIT that really blew my mind about the notion of marriage being built on the shadows of society. Her thesis, I can't remember her name, I wanna give it to you guys. Her thesis was the reason marriage was able to be executed was there was a lot of secrecy. And if you look at like her theory on like 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50 housewives just looking the other way, and then evolution as women became more equals of just cheating but not being exposed, hiding, and as we go into a world where it's just hard to hide, like completely and everything's being documented as privacy goes less and less away, what happens to that? I think back to VR, there's some incredible thinking around what's gonna happen with VR porn that I think is, it's just true, they're the fastest innovators in the space. VR makes your brain think that you're 99% there. What happens for men with porn that think it's 99% real in a VR environment? So I think, look, I think, back to your thing, I think for us to think that shit's not gonna change and not gonna change aggressively with very different technologies, yeah, I think, I think a lot of things are gonna change. But, but I would also tell you, and again, maybe predicate on the optimism, I think the more that the more we expose the shadows, the, that we may not see it because it takes a long time, but if you think about, I, I'll actually give you a uh, focus group of one. As I started getting internet fame and realizing more of my shit was gonna be out there and I took f- selfies on the way here, the people in the street, like I've lived a different way. Like it's interesting how freeing it can be if you kind of, I, j- no joke, as a real funny, like where I'm trying to get to, I literally live my life at this point as if it's on the record 24 seven. I'm conditioning myself for knowing that all of you are gonna wear contact lenses in 10 years and you could be streaming that or recording it. Like, this is real. Like, you can wish how it's not gonna be, but these things are coming and so, I don't know exactly how to answer your your question of like what's gonna happen, but I definitely think there's gonna be friction. Like, I think the way things are now are being challenged, not just in television ads versus Facebook screen versus Snapchat, but in like all social norms and you know, it's just a different world, man. Got to go, one more, my man. How are you? Good, man. Uh, so the world that I am in, yeah. and um, obviously a lot of protocols are going to change. A lot of what, brother? A lot of protocols are going to change as new innovative and new clients. 
I talk a lot about EQ, attention, just talk about hustle. And give everyone a little gist about my hustle. The most <laughs> Thank you for knowing that. Yeah, one thing I didn't touch on that I appreciate you alluding to, I'm, and, and I, I think this has been a very big reason we were able to grow VaynerMedia, and, um, and I think as you get bigger it gets harder, and just in general, you know, for people that know a little bit about me, I, I, being an immigrant, I, I don't think I have all that many talents, but what I definitely know more than anything is that hard work is an absolute variable. I think that way too many people, this whole notion of, well Gary, I work smart, and that somehow substitutes working hard is really quite silly and I think it, it breeds itself in talented organizations like this and startups where, where one thinks their talent can trump somebody outworking them. I think, for example, creative is subjective. Delivering something on time is not. You know, and so these are things that we kind of think a whole lot about and I think no question in a world where a lot of stuff's being commoditized because of the scale of the infrastructure of society that hard work is a stunning variable, but it's only hustle to what you actually want to happen in your life. So the cliche way I talk about it is I work 15 and 17 hours a day because I have these business ambitions, but I would argue I had a very telling meeting the other day where I have a friend who's made over $100 million and he's sitting there and he's crying and complaining to me that he doesn't spend enough time with his family and I was like, literally I had no love for him. He's a real good friend. I'm like, fuck you, I'm like, you have nothing but money, like that is, you're not doing it for that, you're being selfish, you wanna spend more time with your family, spend more time with your family. So, hustle can come in a lot of forms, like, you know, it depends on what you wanna deploy it, but if you wanna be great at your craft, if you wanna be great at what you do professionally, to even begin to think in today's environment that you can pull that off in an eight hour day is laughable, it's just not real. And so, I'm a very, very, very big believer in hard work, because I think it's the differentiation from uh, in the marketplace. Because if talent was enough, all the number one draft picks and all these sports leagues and they would win, all these different artists that have music talent would win. Hustle, I think, is the backbone of how we built what we built. Um, it was funny, as we started hiring older people, you know, I'm busy. So I'd have meetings at eight or nine p.m. at the office, like that's when I could meet them. Um, and, and it was, I knew I was onto something as I was starting to hire more senior people because every one of them were on the floor stunned how many fucking people were at VaynerMedia at 8.30 at night working. And they would always comment on like, holy shit, huh? And the truth is, and this is not a joke, I do feel like our hustle at 650 and 100 million and a little bit of, a little bit of love finally is coming down a little bit. Success uh, you know, absolutely pushes against hustle. Um, and so, one of the reasons I'm doing my daily vlog and documenting it is to remind all these fuckers that hard work is a factor. So, thank you guys for having me.